The doors are closing. Ron is in the room. Yeah. And the man to introduce him is the founder of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, still serves as chairman and CEO, Mr. Lou Rockwell. Well, how do you introduce Ron Paul? I could obviously take the rest of this meeting telling you about his qualifications. I'll just mention a couple of things that when the Mises Institute was founded, this man who, from the time he was a medical student, was reading Austrian economics and is, because long ago, even though his professional qualifications are in medicine, uh, is a real Austrian economist, um, was a big help to the founding of the Institute, um, financially, helped get us on the road. And one of our members here was just reminding me of our first conference in 1983 in Washington, D.C. on the gold standard that uh, a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors came to debate Ron. Fed was, I think, a less arrogant institution maybe in those days. Ron beat him, by the way, Charles Partee. You won't be surprised to find out. Ron has been beating the Federal Reserve ever, the, ever since. Uh, the fact that Ben Bernanke is having so much trouble today in Washington due to Ron Paul and all the work he's done. So building on the work of Mises and Rothbard and Hayek and all our other great heroes, um, we have our current hero who in his presidential campaign took the Austrian school to a, a big step up uh, so that today there's no question that uh, all over this country, as Tom Woods mentioned, young people, old people, uh, everybody's interested in the ideas of the Austrian school. And uh, we have a lot to say, a lot of thank yous to say to our next speaker, uh, for this wonderful thing that's happening, for the trouble Bernanke is in, Dr. Ron Paul. Thank you, thank you very much. Like I often say, uh, I don't get that applause in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so it's good to be at home. It's good to be in Texas. And it's good to be back in America. So uh, it's, it's very nice to be here and among friends. But I do notice, Lou, I, I, I think there are more people here than, than before. It seems like there's, being, there's some growth in our movement. And thank you very much for coming. There was a time when we would have meetings and maybe there'd be six or eight or 10 or 12 of us talking about what we ought to do with the future. And uh, now, now it is uh, a delight to see the growth and the enthusiasm. And uh, to me, it's very encouraging. I get a lot of credit for uh, encouraging other people and uh, getting them involved. But the truth is, is, especially when I go to the universities, I get a lot of encouragement because uh, I find the young people are responding so favorably. But th this is, um, there, there is definite uh, signs that significant change is occurring. And uh, I do truly believe there is a revolution going on in this country. <laughs> And I say that in, 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 the, uh, in the good sense of the word, uh, a revolution, a true revolution is uh, philosophic. It, it's a change of ideas. And uh, it's, it's pervasive. It's not a Republican revolution or a Democratic revolution. And I often think about uh, you, you know, how the revolution occurred in the 30s, at least a continuation of one that actually started a little early, but a significant uh, revolutionary change in, in attitude. And then it was sort of the climax came when uh, it was announced, it was official when we had President Nixon say, we're all Keynesians now. So there may be a day that uh, we'll get up and we'll have somebody in Washington say, we're all Austrians now. <laughs> You know, it has been a lot of fun and a lot of enjoyment, especially for me in the last two years, and also very hectic at times. 
Uh, but um, things definitely changed after the presidential campaign, dramatically. There was a big change in my personal life. There was a big change in, in attitudes and respect for what uh, we all have been saying for so long. But actually, there's a change in, in uh, walking through airports. And uh, that sometimes is, uh, you know, quite, uh, you, you know, enjoyable. I meet a lot of people. But it is fascinating. Why I'm so fascinated is by the individuals who come up and are excited about getting a picture or talking about what I've been doing. And I can tell you, the people who come and talk to me and want more information and all, they're very diverse. Believe me, they do not look like the typical Republican. And, uh, and I think this is great. <laughs> Those interested uh, come from all walks of life. There is no doubt that they don't come from the business class or the banking class, although we'll have them, but they'll come from the working class and in you know, all, all uh, areas of, of the society. But because freedom is so popular and brings people together, which has been my argument, if we follow the Constitution, defend liberty, then all of a sudden we melt away so many of our, our differences. But it also invites a bit of a problem because uh, individuals who do come, sometimes I am dumbfounded and uh, all of a sudden new friends and they, uh, they, they seem to be even more than I expected. For instance, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to totally understand why uh, the TSA employees would be excited about talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> But it does happen, so I just wrote it off for a while. Yeah, they know I'm a congressman and they just think that they have to, you know, be real friendly. But I swear, some of them are very, very sincere. And just the other day, this individual was reading all of my stuff and calling in the weekly report on the telephone and listening to it. So he's been very involved. So this idea that we can take people and stereotype them and, and say, well, they're in this category and they're not open to our ideas. And I, it is, I marveled at it to think that really, with the ideas of liberty and limited government, we can approach anybody and everybody. And to me, I think that's just fantastic. You know, for a long time, uh, we were a very small minority. We still are a minority, and we have to uh, recognize that. We still have a long way to go. But uh, several years ago, before we were getting any attention at all, I was talking to uh, a member of Congress, belonged to the Black Caucus, and uh, there was some moaning and groaning about, you know, taking care of uh, people who were in the minority. And I told him, I, I looked at this congresswoman, and I said, look, you have no idea what it's like to be in the minority. You ought to try being a libertarian in the U.S. Congress. <laughs> but that, uh, that, that is changing right now, and uh, fortunately, I think, all to, the, all to our, our, our benefit. But uh, we certainly have a, a lot of problems yet to, to deal with. This past week, uh, we had a perfect example of, uh, of where we really stand, especially on the foreign policy. Foreign policy might be the hardest not to crack as far as getting people to come to a better understanding. I thought maybe after the election, uh, you know, up in Massachusetts, that people might say, hey, maybe, maybe they do really want some changes here. Maybe we ought to look at things more carefully. And uh, we had a vote uh, this week, some of you might have read about it, had to do with Haiti. And I thought, well, maybe they'll look at this. Maybe they'll read the bill. Maybe they'll pay some attention. And maybe there'll be more than one vote. Maybe there'll be three votes or four. Uh, the, the vote, uh, the bill simply said, uh, we express our condolences and our sympathies for the people who have suffered in Haiti. That is what the, that is what the title said, and that's what uh, nobody looks at any of that stuff until they get to the floor, and that's what the little sentence is on the desk. What are you voting on? Oh, to express our, our sympathies for the people of Haiti. Uh, but uh, if you read the bill, you find out that it was an endless 
commitment of militarism and occupation and no limitation on funds to stay there as far as uh, anybody's concerned uh, forever. So the vote was going on and um, there were, it was like 430 to three. And I thought, well, see, tripled our vote. <laughs> <laughs> But I was wrong. It didn't work. People started looking at it, and probably people running over say, "Do you, do you know what you're doing?" <laughs> you know. So that so then it was uh, 430 to two. Then all of a sudden, you know, you can remove, you change your vote at the last minute. Then it turned out uh, 432 to one, <laughs> and uh, I was sitting. I was sitting with close friends who understand a little bit about this, but they also understand from their viewpoint, this is too risky for them to deal with, you know, standing on principle on this. And they said, and they looked at me and they said, Ron, it looks like you're all by yourself again. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, it's just soon have that because my message is that there's, you know, it's me against the state. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So it's a terrible way to get symbolism, but uh, in a way, that's the way we all are when you think about the numbers. But the difference is, is we're dealing with ideas, and we don't have to deal with 51% of the population. Most people are followers. Congress eventually will follow when we become the dominant philosophy of the country, and everybody uh, is desperately looking for some answers for the crisis and the problems that have been created by the illusion of, of uh, Keynesian and socialist economics. So, and they're looking more carefully all the time. Uh, the other delight about coming into politics uh, from our viewpoint is that, you know, typically if you're a conventional conservative Republican, you know, you get a lot of interviews on Fox News Network, you know? But uh, if you come at it from a free market viewpoint and an Austrian viewpoint, all of a sudden, you know, occasionally on some of the liberal stations, there'll be good civil libertarians and they'll understand foreign policy. And instead of, since the campaign was over, instead of being excluded from Fox, I, I was excluded, of course, during the campaign and given a lot of grief. But now, I think it's been over 50 times since I've been interviewed on Fox on economic issues uh, since the campaign. But the more liberal stations, some of them uh, uh, wouldn't dare want to talk to me because their agenda is uh, Democratic Party politics and, and they're not for liberty, they're just for uh, Democratic Party politics and big government. But even on those stations, you will have a few on there that are very honest people. Now the one individual that I never had heard of, and that shows my shortcomings, before the campaign I had heard of him but never watched the program, and that was John Stewart. But that, that guy is pretty fascinating. I've come to respect him, and I see he's most likely he comes from the left, but he's an honest person. And when the left really messes up, he loves to go and get them. And uh, th that, those are the kind of people, and, and therefore it is not unusual to see somebody like a John Stewart befriend us, all of us through me, by, I don't know, I've been on a show, I know at least twice, maybe three times. So those kind of shows we, we get onto, they're considered liberal shows. Uh, but but the, the delightful, message here is that we do approach all spectrums and that means this can be a um, a true uh, a true movement a true uh, revolutionary change and we should be uh, very optimistic about uh, what we see so far the um, question of the tea parties come up uh, I, I believe it was during the uh, <laughs> during the campaign um, uh, the presidential campaign that somebody uh, during the campaign uh, it wasn't always our astute central organization occurred I mean we were uh, we ran a campaign because there was an excitement out there and there was a lot of spontaneity to it and there was a lot of spontaneous fundraising efforts and the use of the tea party in modern days I believe really started at that particular time. The, um, uh, the subsequently though, since then, there's been a lot of, of Tea Party movements, a lot of Tea Parties, 
And now it's pretty hard to identify uh, exactly who they are and what they are and, uh, and, and exactly what's, what's going on. But it, it is a, it, I think it's a good sign because they're anti-Washington and they're anti-Republican establishment and anti-Democrat establishment, and I believe that's good. But uh, those of us who deal only in academic uh, education and also in, uh, in trying to change ideas, that's a little bit different than dealing with, uh, with, with Tea Party movements. But uh, those who are more involved in politics, I think they're rather sig significant. But all I got to say about it is that uh, you just can't reject them all or endorse them all because they're, they are uh, very diverse. And I believe what has happened was there a lot of people who spontaneously came together not fully uh, aware of exactly what they believed in. Uh, they had the energy and the uh, disapproval of what was happening, and they came together. But then all of a sudden, when the conventional politician realized, hey, there's a few people disgruntled out there. Hey, that must be a new movement. I better get into that movement and get in front of the line so I can be a leader of that movement. And that's essentially what has happened. They're jumping in and they claiming. And uh, there's pretty strong evidence that, uh, that many of the uh, Tea Party uh, meetings are, uh, are infiltrated by the neoconservative element and not an anti-war uh, sound money uh, uh, group of people. But uh, nevertheless, uh, our, our job really is spreading ideas and those ideas being so pervasive that uh, they will influence not only the parties but uh, the, the Tea Party uh, people as well. But it, it is certainly encouraging uh, that, that there is a, this much excitement. You know, the other day I was uh, talking over in, um, in, in, in Atlanta and I had just been reading and doing some research on uh, a subject uh, dealing with um, intelligence gathering. You know, that thing that the CIA does every once in a while? And, uh, <laughs> and I um, uh, made the statement, which uh, I don't back away from, but it came, came out uh, after me expressing my concern about, you know, the secret government and how much control they have. And I had just read recently that, uh, you know, when the Soviet system collapsed, uh, guess who really got in charge? The KGB. The KGB took over, ran things, and right now, 70% of anybody that has an important position in Russia today were KGB members. And my, my thoughts were that, you know, we ought to be cautious. I mean, I, I know we've complained about it, and the CIA is something that I've been uh, criticizing for so many years. Quite frankly, I believe that if you have a truly constitutional republic, you would not even have a CIA. And then the, the opposition will immediately say, oh, you don't care. You're, you don't care about uh, protecting America and all those, all those arguments. But then again, the other side of that argument is how much more money do you want? Uh, you claim that you have, well, we know you have $75 billion for the 16 agencies, and you don't do a, all that good a job. And, um, and you want more money and more personnel to do things that we don't even know what you're doing, and yet the CIA is funded uh, not only directly but indirectly. They run their own businesses. Every once in a while they get in the drug business. And, uh, and, and they're a government unto themselves. Uh, Chalmers Johnson said it was a private army for the president. That is, until they turn on the president, and then who knows what happens. But it, it is, it's done in secrecy, and uh, it's, it, it, they're pervasive. They're, they're into elections around the world, they're into assassinations, they're into uh, uh, interrogations and torture as, 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 as well as uh, being involved in just about everything around the world, and nobody really knows much about it. And that, that to me is the, the, the big complaint. You know, you wouldn't have to spend a heck of a lot of money if you just had a few people who were responsible for gathering up information of uh, individuals or groups that might want to attack us. And uh, maybe what they ought to do 
is uh, maybe just listen to the person who wants to tell him, well, my son's a bit crazy and he's liable to come over here and do something to you. <laughs> and that would have probably cost about a $10 for a phone call, you know? <laughs> That's, uh, that's not likely to happen. They're going to, uh, to want more and more money. But, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the Federal Reserve System. And uh, I think we could deal with the Federal Reserve System the same way I suggested we deal with the CIA. We really don't need the Federal Reserve at all. <laughs> The big question is, what's going to happen to the audit bill? It's in the House, ver House bill of regulation, the, the bill I voted against because it's an atrocious bill, but it's still the system works that way, so I had the chance to stick it on there. I, I did. It's not doing so well in the Senate side, and uh, there's a lot of effort over there to make sure it's not in there. But this very week, uh, this whole Bernanke issue is uh, related to the audit audit the bill and the energy so many of you put into it to get the attention of the American people and the congressman uh, right now to get 317 members of Congress to sponsor this bill doesn't mean that, uh, it does mean that the American people have sent a message there and, and I think it's very positive. But uh, what's likely to have, they're, they're likely to water down, but the fact that uh, Bernanke may not make it through means that this is closely tied to the audit bill because there's been put some hold, there have been holds put on uh, the uh, confirmation process and they have to have 60 votes in order to get that out and unless they have an up and down vote on, uh, on auditing the Fed. So the issues are closely tied. I generally over the years have not chosen to go after the individuals. Uh, even though sometimes it's much better to do that because you get a lot more attention because I think it's the, uh, the philosophy of money and, and the banking system. It's not Bernanke who created our crisis. It's the Bernanke-like people that have been around for way too long, especially since 1971. That, that is the real problem. So uh, we, I, I generally don't, but this week, really, it is a big issue. You know, if Bernanke goes down, that means that they have a real setback uh, for their desire to cover up and not allow to have transparency. But there are some over there that are adamantly outspoken against what we're trying to do and against some openness uh, with, with the Federal Reserve. I sense from uh, the discussions I've had and, and the hearings that we've had that the most important thing to the Fed to conceal is, of course, uh, two things. One, international act activities, and second, how they bail out their buddies through the discount window. Those are the two things that they get hysterical over, and that means, oh, you want to turn the power of the money system over to the Congress so that we will let the people know uh, what, what's going on and, and what, what if a bank is weak and the people get to know that? Well, isn't that what you're supposed to know? Why should the Federal Reserve cover up the information? You know, in this day and age, you know, you take a couple, company like Enron. If they, if they fudge the books and lie to the people, and they go to prison for fraud. But here they're saying that if the Federal Reserve comes in and finds out that the bank is very, very weak, their job is to keep it secret. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. They do not like that information getting out about their friends uh, and who they bail out. But the other thing is the international stuff. They have uh, the exclusion on uh, what the GAO can audit is that we're not allowed to look at any international agreements with governments, other central banks, or international financial organizations. That's IMF and World Bank. And here we have a central bank that can do all these things and they never have to ask the Congress for anything. They don't have to say, hey, you know, we want to send a billion dollars over to country A and we want to make an agreement, guarantee loans, and all these kind of things. Uh, no, they only have to. They just have to click a computer and they can get themselves involved in, in, in any, all these dealings. So in many ways, my, my suspicion is that if we ever got to look at the books, that they're probably very much involved in foreign policy. If our CIA is going over and being involved in elections and assassinations and, and you know, just running the world in a secret manner, 
and they only get $75 billion a year in the open, and they might need 100 or 200 or 300, and they have unlimited credit. It, it, to me, it's unimaginable what they might, what kind of deals they might make. So is it conceivable that the CIA and the Federal Reserve uh, may, may get along quite well together? And it, it, it's a possibility. But the whole thing is, is we're not even allowed to know. The Congress is just there. They're oblivious to it all. The conservatives will say, well, you can't dare restrain the CIA in any manner uh, what, whatsoever. And, uh, and, and then also nobody wants uh, the banking industry and all wants to protect, uh, you know, the central bank. Now, my guess is what will happen is that... Uh, we will not go through the system, get the Senate to pass something, the President signs in all, and next year you're going to have an audit and you're going to know what's going to happen to Fed. Uh, I, I don't think so. It'll be sort of like McCain, McCain Feingold. You finally get a favorable ruling and allow uh, a little bit uh, more freedom on how to spend money and be involved in, in politics. But immediately next week, they're going to have a bill up again that will reinstate some of those re same restrictions. And it'll be in effect by November. And it'll be back to the courts again and take two, three, four years to, uh, you know, overcome it. So it, uh, That'll probably happen on the on the audit. It, even if you get something through, uh, the uh, two cases going on right now, one by Bloomberg and one by Fox, uh, they've been you know the one case has been ruled favorably for uh, the um, uh, Freedom of Information Act, the other not, but they're on appeal. But it's going on and on, and and I think they're very they're very beneficial. But even if you get something through and signed. Uh, I, I, even if it's good, it's going to immediately go to the courts. So it could go a year or two or three. In this age, in this time, from my viewpoint, is that's a long time. Because we're working with a financial system where the foundation has been shattered. There really is no foundation to our monetary system and our financial system. We've had the financial crisis hit, and we have seen this uh, a lot of liquidation uh, and transfer of debt. Of course, the debt was transferred from the big guys to the little guys. It goes from, uh, yes, there was no deflation because debt was transferred. And uh, we, the taxpayer, ended up buying this debt, and they're back at it again and, uh, and, and feeling good about it. But... The foundation is not stable. The financial system, I, I do not believe the, world fi the worldwide financial system can be rebuilt on a dollar reserve standard. Uh, I think they got away with it for a lot longer than they ever dreamed, which means that they just had a bigger bubble than ever before, uh, from 71 up until now, until uh, 2008. Uh, so I don't think that's going to be rebuilt, but the dollar is still being accepted around the world. Uh, people still, you know, the stock market goes down and the dollar, uh, the dollar goes up in value. I think that's all temporary. Uh, the, the one thing I th think that we're facing is not only the dollar bubble, but the bond bubble. Why, why in the world would bonds ever serve anybody's interest? Uh, if, if you could buy a, a, a 10 year bond and make a couple percent interest and, and think that you're going to have something of value at the end of 10 years or 20 years, nobody invests in bonds to protect their assets. So it's all, it's all just, uh, it's all, it's all just gambling and, and trickery that's going on, and then if nobody will buy them out there, the Fed buys them, or the Fed's, uh, you know, wheeling and dealing with other central banks, and they prop up these markets. So it's just, right now, I think it's in everybody's interest to uh, prop up the dollar. But eventually, I think the dollar is, is going to go down and down sharply. Uh, since 1971, the dollar, uh, against a basket of currencies, uh, the Federal Reserve basket of currencies, is down about 32%. Uh, that's serious and significant, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot because other other currencies are the same thing. I mean, why why would anybody think? Well, okay, the dollar's in trouble. Let's all buy euros. You know that that, that wouldn't that wouldn't save us. But even in spite of that, our dollar, which is supposed to be the king uh, of all the currencies, is still down a third from the other currencies in these last several decades. But the CPI, it's down 82%, and against gold, it's down 97%. So the dollar is, is very, very weak. Uh, but it's been, um, you know, I've had people before the banking committee and uh, from, from either the Federal Reserve or Treasury, and uh, 
talking about, you know, the dollar going down and what the significance. And their response usually is, it's okay to go down as long as it's orderly. So I say, oh, okay, if you steal from people in an orderly fashion, then it's okay. <laughs> But that's uh, uh, but their their attitude of of course is that uh, as as long as you don't have the crashing dollar, but I don't believe they can prevent the crash in the dollar. But I don't believe the dollar is going to crash all by itself. I think they're so interlinked. I, I don't know of any time in our history, the history of the world, where it's been so global. In, in nature, where all the currencies are linked together, all the currencies are fiat, and uh, that that the dollar, of course, is is key to this. So some event will come along that will shatter the confidence in the United States. Uh, it, it may be that uh, uh, Osama bin Laden is going to win uh, on what his plans were. You know, his plans were rather precise. He said his his goal was to stir up so much trouble that we would go into the Middle East. Of course, we've been there a long time, and he didn't want us, you know, having anything to say with Saudi Arabia or any, any place else. But in order to bring this to a head, he says, I want to entice the American people over here to get them bogged down in a war. And, uh, and, and the bogging down will uh, be something that will drain the support from the American people. And I think he's doing a fairly good job, but and it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, but he also wanted to drain us financially. And lo and behold, I think we have a few financial problems. Uh, so we're doing his bidding there. And the other thing he wanted us to do was get so involved and get so careless with how we were dealing with our foreign policy that more there would be more victims, which would create more recruits for him. And uh, so I believe uh, very sincerely that since 9-11, uh, since that probably the number of Muslims around the world that uh, hate us and despise us, those numbers have probably grown. And they uh, this claim, well, they don't belong to the Taliban or they don't belong to Al-Qaeda. And uh, I think those numbers don't mean very much. I just, I just believe that there's a lot of people in this world responding uh, logically to, to our foreign policy and that uh, there's many more enemies, uh, enemies out there than, than ever before. So the, this, this means, though, that um, nothing in, in that manner will be corrected uh, overseas and, and unless we have a change in, in, uh, in our foreign policy. But, you know, the significant changes, uh, I, I don't expect them to come with uh, next year's election. Uh, a lot of times I hear the statement, this coming election is the most important election in the history uh, of, of the country, and therefore we have to win this, and uh, we have to put uh, we have to put in this individual uh, because it's so important. Um, now they're they're all significant and all, but I, I just don't think it's uh, it's going to be that way. I think what's going to happen is that uh, uh, since we are not going to get 10, 20, 30, or 40 more constitutionalists in the Congress, uh, I think we're going to see a crisis. And uh, when the crisis hits and the dollar crisis hits, then there'll be a time when um, the market, the free market, will demand that we do something differently. If people don't trust the money, what, what, what power does the federal government have? They've been totally neutralized. The only thing left for them is the creation of new money out of thin air. They can't tax us anymore. I mean, every day there's less people working. For 10 years now, the middle class has been losing, uh, uh, losing wealth. We lose wealth, we lose good jobs, real, real, uh, the standard of living is going down, and the good jobs aren't going to come back, so they can't tax us in the true sense of the word. There's, there's not enough uh, wealth left to do it. It'll just make the crisis that much worse. Eventually they'll quit loaning money to us, but then the telltale sign will be when they can't print the money at will. And then the more they print, the more, uh, the, the, the more the people become disenchanted. So right now the, uh, the checks will keep coming. They will print the checks for as long as, as necessary. Social Security will keep getting their checks. But what they cannot control 
because it's beyond all governments, is to maintain value in a currency. The markets ultimately determine that. And even today, the value in the dollar depends a lot on, uh, on, on the force that they use, the legalized cartel, the, the emphasis that we in this country is using the currency, they have legal tender laws, and if you start trying to circulate silver dollars uh, as currency, you could go to jail and have your silver stolen from you. So uh, this, this is, um, uh, you, you know, we're at a point where something, something will have to give. And uh, I think what will happen then is that uh, when it stops functioning, there will be like de facto nullification. I don't think we'll ever have legal nullification. This is not going to go to the courts. Oh, yeah, that sounded like a good idea. We think the original intent was the states could nullify laws. Well, what the states will do and what the individual is going to do, they're just going to ignore the federal government. And, and And that, that of course, will uh, bring on, uh, you know, more problems, but uh, then again, the society will have to be rebuilt. And that, that is where I think uh, uh, we come in on, on, on how it should be rebuilt, how pervasive our ideas are, how important it is to have sound money. I did make a token st a step uh, a couple weeks ago and talked about it last week, uh, just to make the point of what, how we would rebuild you know, when the time comes where we could have another currency. And my suggestion has been to um, allow compet competition in currencies. And I made the point that, uh, you know, even in, in the post office, we have a little bit of competition because you don't have to use the post office to mail a package. Uh, you have UPS and uh, FedEx, and, and uh, it hasn't been the end of the world, and the post office is still there. Uh, I don't know how long they would last if we legalized the delivery of first-class mail, which wouldn't be a bad idea, but uh, we allow competition. Uh, we're always being challenged, but we still have the legal right to educate our children in private school and homeschooling, and that's good to people who can do it, uh, afford it, or manage it. That's excellent. But it also sends a message to the public school system that uh, especially I, I really get the greatest delight when I see homeschoolers winning some of these geography bees and spelling bees and find out, well, you mean they actually got educated at home? How did that happen? Uh, but there's competition there. It'd be great if we could do something in medicine to preserve competition in medicine. You know, they talk so much on all this reform about the public choice. How many times have you ever heard anybody on TV get up and say, what's the matter with the private choice? Why don't we guarantee a private choice in medicine, which would be the medical savings account? Every penny you put in the account, you get off your taxes, you pay your own bills, and you buy a major medical policy, and the major medical would be actually insurance. It wouldn't be this prepaid social uh, social po policy. No, that's... Um so the one thing that we should always strive for is to have uh, enough uh, option to get out of a government system, but I think it's becoming tougher all the time. Uh, and, and I'm afraid if, if and when they do something more with medicine, there won't be any chance at all for you to opt, opt out of the system. But in money, money's a little bit different. It's more esoteric and people don't understand it as well. But the bill that I've introduced does three things in order to allow individuals to use gold and silver. Uh, the first thing is it should be appealing uh, to a few people, if you say, well, you know, the Constitution has never been amended, and what does the Constitution says? Only gold and silver can be used as legal tender. That, that wouldn't be too bad, just legalize the Constitution. But that's... <laughs> but that's a... Uh, that's, that's, no, that's a, you guys are radical. Uh, that's a radical idea. That's a radical idea for, uh, for, for Washington to, to do that. To do that, though, you have to repeal the legal tender laws. That's where they get their monopoly control. You can't, you can't use anything other than Federal Reserve notes as legal tender. Uh, and the other thing you would do is have, uh, allow private mints. If you have a gold, gold coin or silver coin, you ought to be allowed, allowed to use it. And they say, oh, uh, the, um, the private mints might defraud you. They might not have a full ounce of gold or a full ounce of silver. 
I said, well, the fraud laws would take care of that. It's just too bad we can't apply those fraud laws to the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> And the, other, and the other issue is uh, you shouldn't tax money. You know, if, if you want to, if you want to uh, deal in silver, silver dollars and you go and trade in some of your Federal Reserve notes for silver dollars and you just go into a shop, they're going to they're gonna say you have to pay a sales tax. Oh, 7% sales charge on that. Then you go out and you take your silver and you spend your silver. Oh, the silver went from $18 to $20. You have to pay capital gains tax on that. You know, it, it can't work. So you have to get all taxes off money uh, and, and all taxes off silver and gold. So <laughs> why, why should they be so intimidated? I, we're not forcing it. We're not blowing up the buildings. We're not closing it down. Uh, we're, we're just saying, allow competition. Of course, they know the reason is uh, the competition might embarrass uh, uh, embarrass the opposition, and the price of gold embarrasses the opposition as well. They don't like to see, uh, and, and governments are notoriously uh, anxious always to keep the dollar price uh, or the currency price of gold down because that's a vote against the currency. And um, I, I told us tell a story in in, uh, in the Fed, and Lou Lou knows about this story. Is uh, one day in the midst of the uh, of the dollar crisis and gold soaring up to uh, seven eight hundred dollars, we had a private meeting with Volcker, and that's one thing I have given Volcker credit for. I, he at least would talk to you uh, in in a reasonably sensible way. But he had a private breakfast over there for us just to talk. But uh, Lou and I got there, and there was a staff person there, and we were just chatting and, uh, and, not, and nothing special. And Volker came in, and the amazing thing is Volker, uh, you know, he, he wasn't being not cordial, but he went immediately to a staff person. He says, what's the price of gold? <laughs> So they, they know about it, and just think how long they artificially held gold at $35 an ounce. People always talk about, well, what are they doing these days? Well, you know, with, uh, with uh, our, uh, um, you, our Federal Reserve's ability to make all kinds of deals with other central banks and financial organizations and foreign governments, uh, they have the facility. Uh, to do whatever they want in the marketplace. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, they've actually been given authority to get involved in markets. So do I have proof that they get involved in rigging the gold price? Uh, no, I, I don't, but I suspect they, it's in their interest to do it. My guess is that they usually come in and maybe get involved, not when gold prices are getting too high, but when there is a more or less natural correction, you know, let's say markets do that. They go up and then they go down. That they'll do this and then they'll come in and maybe try to punish people. But that might be too conspiratorial for a group like this. Uh, you wouldn't buy in any of that. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, I think that that, uh, uh, that a little competition shouldn't hurt them, but they're not likely to give it, uh, give that to us. But in the meantime, if we establish what real money is, uh, then in the midst of a crisis, we ought to be able to come up uh, with, with an alternative. The um, issue of, of liberty itself is, of course, uh, what I have been involved in. Uh, I, I frequently said that, you know, the financial system motivated me in the 1970s to run, and, and I've been interested in a lot of policy changes. But really, the true interest I have, and I'm sure it's uh, also yours, and that is the preservation of liberty. That, that to me, is what it's all about. If we were permitted, if we were in charge and permitted to uh, keep the government's hands off the needed correction, there would have been some uh, painful moments. People, uh, matter of fact, some of those big companies, AIG, oh, well, uh, Goldman Sachs, could have been very painful for them. They might have gone bankrupt, who knows? But just keep, <laughs> just keep our hands off and let it happen. Uh, but if, it, uh, if you have a, a really some significant changes made, a lot of liquidation of debt and a lot of scary things happening after a year or so, if we had our freedom, if we had the marketplace and property rights and contract rights and sound money and strictly limited government, 
I am so convinced of that philosophy that within a year or two, we would all be back on our feet again, even if those of us who have tried real hard to protect ourselves and our, our families, if all of it gets wiped off the table, but you're allowed to go back to work and allowed to keep what you earn, I'll tell you what, I think economic growth would come back so fast and we wouldn't have to worry about it. What's happened in Washington, they've lost confidence and an understanding about freedom and liberty. There's, uh, that's secondary uh, to everything that they do. And, and the argument, of course, is that uh, uh, we have to give up our civil liberties. Since 9-11, it's give up our civil liberties. We need the CIA. We need all this interrogation. We need this tor torture. We need all this because what good is it if you're not safe? How can you be free? You can't enjoy your freedom unless you're safe. But, of course, we know that once you start sacrificing your liberty for the so-called safety that government is supposed to provide, you end up, of course, with neither. And I think the point is well made when uh, uh, it, it is said that uh, when a President Bush or Obama comes up and he says, my main job is to make you safe. Well, is the main job of a policeman to make you safe in your home? Well, can you imagine how many policemen would be to make you safe in your home? I thought we were made safe with the Second Amendment is the way we were supposed to make ourselves. But too often we've made, we've made these sacrifices and the people are willing to go along with it. If there's a, if there's a major crisis overseas with another major bombing or a lot of Americans being killed, uh, there will be a much uh, greater eagerness to even sacrifice more of our liberties. So the issue is liberty. And uh, the two issues that I have picked to concentrate on in relationship to protection of liberty has been the monetary system because it is so key in everything that we do. Uh, it was interesting when I first read that, why is money so important? Well, it's one half of every bit of your, every good transaction you have. So therefore, the issue of money and the value of your money and what they do is involved in every single uh, thing that, that, that we do. And, uh, and, and the, other has, the other interest I've had is in foreign policy. And I have to admit that uh, probably in the early 70s, although I did have uh, some personal experiences about uh, what it was like for our government to be involved, remembering World War II, uh, remembering Korea War, some of my teachers going off and being killed, and, and then Vietnam and being in the military for five years in the middle of the 1960s, and, and thinking about it, but it wasn't the, the top issue on my mind. But as time has gone on, it, uh, it is interconnected with the monetary system as, as well as the issue of liberty. And of course, you can't talk about the money issue and the issue of liberty or the foreign policy uh, without considering the foreign policy because the more we're engaged overseas, uh, the, the bigger mess we, we, we get ourselves into. And uh, I have a little note paper that I use at, at home and uh, the one quote on there is uh, war is the health of the state. Um, and I, I believe that so sincerely that uh, our civil liberties are undermined. Uh, one time uh, during the presidential's debate, uh, Tim Russert came in and he made the initial announcement, well, this debate uh, is, um, is going to be on uh, domestic uh, economic issues because last time you guys talked about foreign policy. And I even, uh, uh, you know, when I had my first chance, I made, uh, a, uh, I hope, a polite objection to this uh, by saying that you can't separate the two. How, how can you uh, believe that uh, your foreign policy doesn't have a lot to do with your domestic economic policy because it runs up debt and all the problems that you have? So it's all intertwined, but it should be narrowed down mostly uh, significantly to the issue of liberty. I think our country uh, was the greatest, and we had the greatest amount of wealth and abundance of any other country because we were the freest nation. But that freedom is, uh, is on the ropes. Uh, and I think a growing number of American people are agreeing with this, uh, with us because they see what's happening. And, uh, we have a great opportunity. I see a grand coalition building. They will not ever be in agreement on all our views. But, uh, if we respectfully present our case for civil liberties and the anti-war position, I really am convinced that we will soften the market for them accepting our economic views because their economic views are non-viable. 
It's not so much that they will think, oh yeah, this is really important and that's what we must do. And we accept their, their argument that the greatest prosperity and the greatest amount of wealth and the best way to take care of the poor and the middle class is through free markets. But it's the failure of their system that will make them think uh, differently. So we have this tremendous opportunity to bring this coalition together and be available to help uh, help rebuild. And this is what I think is happening. Uh, and it's as, as I mentioned about the Tea Party, not reflective in that, but we have to obviously uh, influence them. I am uh, under the um, on, under the belief that a uh, hundred years ago or so, uh, for some reason, our intellectual co community got divided on the on the ideas of liberty, and I don't think the founders were divided. I think they understood that if you had personal liberty. Uh, it meant freedom of speech and your civil liberties and uh, that you aren't going to have an income tax and that the government was supposed to run everything. But all of a sudden, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, it became uh, uh, more understood that uh, freedom is divided in half. You have economic freedom over here and you have personal liberties over here and everybody's supposed to join in and make the world safe for democracy. And that's where we've been, that's where we've been stuck. And we got to we got to put it back together again. I think there should be a rallying cry for financial reasons and moral reasons and constitutional reasons for us to change the foreign policy. And we uh, will know that we're making progress then uh, on that when we see the troops coming home from all over the world. And on personal liberties, we get a lot of good lip service from the conservatives. Yes, uh, we want individual liberty. We're for this, except when it comes to what you put in your mouth and what you smoke and what else you do and what you say and what political correctness is and all these things. And maybe we can get them to come around and knowing what real liberty is all about and, and put personal liberty in context of the property. Property really, uh, you know, if you only had one thing to protect, you don't need 10 amendments. Wouldn't property protect it? If nobody can take your property, including the government, and you have property, it would protect your First Amendment rights because you, you, it's your personal property. It's your house, your home, your church, or whatever, your newspaper. Uh, that's private property. So if you could just get the conservatives to come over and say, oh, oh, this is a property right for you to defend individual liberty. But it has to be put back together. And it has to be started uh, with the idea of where our rights comes from uh, and, and what is important. One thing that annoys me to no end that I hear constantly in Washington and you hear it all the time is hyphenated Americans. I mean, why do we have to be hyphenated? And when we make progress, there will not be hyphenated Americans. There will be individuals Americans deserving equal rights for everyone. Freedom actually is a rather new idea. If you look at all of history, thousands and thousands of years. And, uh, and, and yet, uh, we're, we're about to give up on this grand experiment. The grand experiment has lasted, uh, you know, for a couple hundred years and is about to fade. So this is a time that has come upon us to make our stand. The Mises Institute has made their stand for a good many decades and they've had a great deal of influence and I was impressed. Lou, when we were at uh, the University of Michigan, they started talking about Austrian economics and all these things, so it is pervasive. The Mises Institution and other libertarian think tanks and free market groups deserve a lot of credit for the change in the mood of this country, so I congratulate you. I thank you for coming today, and I will be around for a little bit fighting for the cause of liberty. Thank you very much.